The cruising committee puts on these educational evenings aimed at providing the very latest information on the subject presented. A tonight's presentation will be by Mike Prince on electronic navigation and the future of paper charts. Having personally had over 50 years of both ocean racing and cruising, and being an avid lover of the planning and plotting on charts before and during the race or voyage, such as ringing the lighthouses, then entering the position on the chart at least every hour, I'm really looking forward with great interest to hear what the future will bring. To this end, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Mike Prince. Mike is the National Charting Director of the Australian Hydrographic Office and is here to update us on the future of nautical charting, both in Australia and internationally. The use of electronic charts, the impact this may eventually have on the chart carriage requirements, specifically in racing regulations. Mike Prince, thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, look, first up, I just want to uh, tell you that this has taken since May to organise for various reasons. Uh, so hiding up somewhere at the back is my brother, Stephen Prince, at the very back. So I just want to thank Steve publicly for all the effort um, cajoling people and getting to the right people and, and helping make this happen. So thanks, Steve. <laughs> also got here tonight uh, one of my colleagues, Peter Gallagher, who's one of our nautical cartographers, and uh, I suppose I could call him our leading yachtsman in our office. Um, he keeps telling us he is. <laughs> Simon Weston from 33 South, Andy Green from 33 South, and Wayne Gallivan from Boatbox. Uh, whom you've probably all dealt with at various times. Look, what I wanted to do tonight was to give you quite an update on where we're at, if I can find the right mouse, from a couple of aspects. I've got a few things that are really starting to converge that are affecting, frankly, the future of paper charts as we see them and as you will see them. So while we're here, I'd like to try and bring the yacht racing community into line with the Safety of Life at Sea Convention because I'd have to say at the moment, it isn't. Um, it's got its reasons, but it is out of step. I also want the opportunity for my office to refocus the resources that we've got, which are very limited, to the activities that are of the greatest benefit to everybody. And that's not just yachties, I'm afraid. Um, it's also an awful lot of big ships. So the things I'm going to come through, about three different issues. Uh, what's driving our resources? What's, what is the demand for electronic charts versus paper nautical charts? A bit about well, which charts am I talking about? Because people use the phrase electronic charts to mean almost anything, frankly. Uh, what are the current yacht race and re requirements? And a few lessons learnt that keep coming up. Um, and I'll start going on about an offer that we have made, mainly to get your attention, frankly. Uh, we've made an offer to provide free electronic navigation charts for a period that covers the Sydney to Hobart yacht race and enough to either get to the start or get back from the finish. Uh, and it's for that area of South East Australia. And I'll, I'll go into a few more details on that later. And then finally, cover what we're going to be doing with the future of paper charts. I've just gone through this same exercise with the Australian Maritime Safety Authority and it's taken about 18 months of lobbying to get their um, attention and a change of direction. So compared to them, you guys are easy. Uh, we've also gone through port organisations, we've gone through training organisations, coastal pilots, cruise ship industry, the lot. And we have an awful lot of competing demands, so we're trying to find a new balance. So where are we? First up, who's asking for our, our, what we do? There's about 460-odd thousand ENCs we sold or distributed last year. That's to both local and international. In comparison, 77,000 paper charts, local and international. That number halved in one year last year. It now represents less than 20% of what we do, and yet it takes over 60% of our resources that just doesn't add up anymore. Um, it's, and, and it's time for us to, to change tune because we've tried for the best part of a decade to get more people. I'm afraid it isn't going to happen. 
So that's all we've gone through over the last um, several years from when we first started doing electronic navigation charts. The green line at the bottom is our resources. The red line up the top is how many things we have to look after. And it's actually not making them, it's the hard part. It's keeping them up to date afterwards, it's actually the hard part. So our, wor our, our workload has roughly tripled. A lot of that's been taken up with new systems. We've got three generations of systems since the first one started. Uh, and what we can do now in a, in a day might have taken us weeks or even months in years gone by. But even so, there are only so many things you can do. And that's what's coming. So we're going, oh, how do we deal with that? There will be another generation of electronic navigation charts, probably at about the time when you guys are starting to use this generation. The standard that we're using at the moment is actually 30 years old. It was developed in the early 1990s as a result of a ship called the Exxon Valdez. You might have heard of that. At the time, it was the world's biggest oil spill. It's not even in the top 25 now. However, that got the International Maritime Organization's attention. And ENCs have followed largely ever since. The fundamental difference is that on a paper chart, you've got a record of where you were. On an ENC, you've got a mark of where you are. And a predictive function in there as well. Paper charts, however, all hydrographic officers are facing the same challenges as we are. We're part of something called the International Hydrographic Organisation. It's headquartered in Monaco, which means occasionally I get some great trips. And it consists of about 80 odd member states. About 50 of them are genuinely active in driving change. And of that, 10 are a bit really active. We are one of them. We're all expected to introduce a new generation of ENCs. We are all struggling with the same resource challenges. Uh, and we're all having to rebalance what we do. We are not alone in that regard. And we are all trying to figure out how to accommodate this new one that all the big ships want in from the mid-2020s. So the UK solution to that, which is everybody considers to be the worldwide source of paper charts, admiralty charts as they are called, they're not actually owned by the admiralty by the way, uh, is that they're going to stop in-house printing in about two years. That's not as dramatic as it sounds. Wayne Gallivan will tell you they already print the UK charts. They print them here locally. So not a huge deal. But that gives you an idea of the change that's coming. We're planning on stopping printing in five years. Uh, in that time, I'm going to probably lose the people that are currently doing the printing, and I'm going to have to fight to replace them. I might or might not be able to. So I need to come up with an alternative solution for printing charts. Um, and in-house isn't one of them. We also distribute our charts via the UK Hydrographic Office. They used to sell more of them than we do. Nowadays, they actually sell less of them than we do. Uh, so they have traditionally made most of their money, they do make a profit, they're the only Hydrographic Office in the world that does by copying other people's charts, it's effectively copying other people's homework, and selling it at a marked up rate. You know, a UK copy of our chart is about $50. An Australian copy of our chart is $35. Uh, but the choices of which charts they continue to update and continue to adopt is driven by commercial demand. So as the number of charts being bought declines, they will be dropping off supplying them and updating them and all those sorts of things. They just won't be available via an alternative route. So poor old Wayne's probably going to be going, gee, what do I do now? The number of chart outlets themselves is declining, both internationally and locally. Uh, there is only so much business to go around when the number of paper charts being sold is declining. There is also the rather wicked expectation that anything electronic must be free. That is a dominating thought in just about everybody's mind. So we can't charge the same amounts for electronic charts to support chart agents who still have the same uh, overheads and costs. So that's why chart agencies are declining. From our position, we've been told repeatedly anything we do new has to come from existing resources. And I'll show you a couple of the new things we have had to introduce. They are required and they are expected 
and they do make a big difference to big ships. Uh, some of them are not even possible to be translated onto paper. Uh, so we're running things in parallel rather than streaming one from the other. So as an example, when we first made the E and Cs, we just copied them off the paper charts. We tried being really clever. It took five years to get about 100 miles down the Queensland coast. And at that stage, we had four more years to do the rest of Australia and Papua New Guinea. It just wasn't going to happen. So we converted over very quickly to, let's just copy the paper charts, which is fine to start with, but it is not the be all and end all. The very first thing is that ships zoom in. And as soon as they zoom in, they've gone beyond the capability of the chart to spot what they do. So then we get to the two boxes on the, sorry, the, first of all, they wanted bigger coverage. So that little rectangle in the bottom left, that was the paper chart, or the area of it. Well, the big ship actually has a problem in the narrow channel. So the chart, the electronic chart, now goes all the way out to the end of the channel. And then they said, oh, well, actually, we have a problem from the anchorages. So then it expanded to cover all the anchorages. Then they turned around and said, the channel's not wide enough. We need to use both sides of the channel, not just the middle. We can't see the sides of the channel. So we're now in the business of adding very fine contours down the slope of the channel, not across the bottom, so that they can literally yaw their way in, fighting crosswinds when they're bringing in car carriers. All of these things take time and resources. And frankly, they carry an awful lot of clout when they say they want something. So next one, what is a paper chart? What is a nautical chart? This is the definition that is out of the UN Convention for Safety of Life at Sea. Special purpose map or specifically compiled database which, from which the map is derived, issued by or on behalf of an authorised hydrographic office or an equivalent. What does that equate to? Special purpose map, nautical chart. Specially compiled database is actually an ENC. It doesn't turn into something that you can view until you actually put it into the machine you're using it on. When we compile it, it just looks like a big text string. That's its native format. It's called S57. Authorised Hydrographic Office. The stuff on the left is Authorised Hydrographic Office. From us, it's Australian ENCs, Solomon Islands ENCs, we make them as well, we will shortly be distributing New Zealand ENCs, but New Zealand makes their own, obviously, and the Oz paper charts. You also notice the difference in prefix. Electronic charts have two letters, paper charts have three. The unofficial ones, which means that they do not qualify to actually be called a chart, not a nautical chart, is people such as CMAP. Garmin and Navionics are now one company. They still keep two brands, but they are one company. Memory map and a bunch of others. We license them to use the data. How much of it they use is up to them. We do not quality control it. More to the point, they don't either. And that's some of the things that I want to get to. So they are not warranted for use by us. They're not warranted for use by the states. And they're not warranted for use by the people that actually make them, which is a bit of a big deal. That's their warranty. I don't expect you to read it all, but that's off the CMAP website. And I'm not specifically targeting CMAP. They're actually just the most informative. Um, and their warning basically says, not for navigation. That's what it translates to. <laughs> and yet, hands up all those that are using them for navigation. More than a few, yeah. Their cautions are not without some sort of foundation. To give you a list of examples. Now this isn't all of them, this is just some of them. These are the bigger ones. 2007, a chart that was five years out of date contributed to the death of somebody in Moreton Bay. They came back in at 30 knots, powerboat, at night and ran into a breakwater that they didn't know was there. They, the guy literally went through the windscreen. Uh, the um, inquest was in 2010. 2008, we were blamed for a reef not being on the chart. It was a yacht called A. Solaire. It was on a delivery voyage from, I think, Fiji at the time, heading across to Townsville, Kansas, or something. Um, yes, it was on the official chart, it just wasn't on his. 
you hopefully have heard about Vestas Wind. It ended up high and dry and in the news in the middle of the Indian Ocean on a reef that didn't exist. Scallywag, last year, exactly the same thing. And in January this year, I had a very determined yachty who actually sent me in three hydrographic notes. First two were near misses, and the third one was to say he was up and on the slips getting repaired um, because he managed to find things that were, well, three years out of date. So these are the sorts of reasons why their warranties, or their lack of it, are actually fairly close to the mark. So to give you a couple of examples, that's the sort of reef that was missing off the chart for Vestas Wind. And I think they end up in replacing about a third of the yacht or thereabouts. It was, yeah, look, this is what I, yeah, yeah. The one on the left is actually the CMAP one. And these two pictures are at about the same scale. So the CMAP one, you might notice that in the middle of that blue bit, there is a territorial sea boundary. Well, you would sort of think that means there's a territory to put a boundary around. <laughs> it's not there. In contrast, on the right, just to make them visible, everything that you can hit has been expanded at that scale. So that's why they've gone to funny round circles. The point is to make them obvious, not to make them accurate. The centres of them are accurate for the position, but the shape, not so much. And that's, as I say, the same scale. Uh, you might know Chris Oxenbold. So was it not the fact that um, with Vestas Wind, that they were zoomed out so far that the rest of the chart, absolutely. It, was on the, it was on the chart, but they, they were zoomed out and the reef didn't show No, it's, a, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. Uh, look, first of all, at any scale, a danger should be on there. Uh, you, you don't remove islands and reefs. That is just fundamentally wrong. Um, the second one is that there is somewhere in there a functional problem whereby if you pan across at a certain scale, you would hope that things at larger scale pop up when they come into range on your screen. And in this case, they don't. And that is the same thing that happened. I don't wish to start an argument. This is a rest of versus rest And it's about auto scaling expedition. Because the reef was on the detailed chart. Yeah, but it wasn't appearing at the scale I intended. But fundamentally, look, no, it is, it, it is not about raster versus vector. The island and the reef should be on the chart at every scale. That is any cartographer's rule. Yes, it is, and that's not open to debate. That is a fundamental cartographic principle. You put dangers on the chart, and that is not open to debate. It really isn't. And any belief otherwise is a disaster looking for a place to happen. We'll pick up the debate no, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> that is the detail that was on the ENC and appears automatically as you pan across and zoom in. Next one. Last year's Around the World race. There's Skellywag heading roughly north towards another reef that doesn't exist on their chart. The only reason that didn't turn into a disaster was race control sent them an email that basically said, just so I can relax a bit, tell me you're happy with your course. They weren't. That's what was actually in front of them. Again, that's what's on both a paper chart and the ENC. The point being they are the official chart. There is a care factor there. They are not made to a price. And that's what they ended up doing. <laughs> now, one thing I would like to point out, the only reason race control knew about the reef either was a chance conversation between one of my staff and race control. We gave them the ENCs. Otherwise, that would have been a written off yacht. So, there you go. Right, how do you get these things? Where do you get them? The official ENCs, and they're the only ones that can use that phrase ENC, is official ones. We make Australian, Solomon Islands, 
We're distributing New Zealand shortly. Uh, other countries all produce them with a two letter prefix. They all come in what's known as the S57 standard, encrypted to an S63 standard. Um, some countries do a local distribution service, not very many. Most of them go through an organisation called the International Centre for ENCs, which is a wholesale distributor, and then they go to commercial distributors such as the Admiralty Vector Chart Service, which is run by the UK. 90% of ENCs for the world come through that service. <coughs> the people that sell them here in Australia are those people for the most part. There are a few others, but they're our primary distributors in Australia for electronic charts. For paper charts, the mix is slightly different, um, but you can get electronic charts from them as well. One thing I will say for CMAP is that they do distinguish on their website between commercial and recreational. So any misunderstanding is because you haven't looked at their website, I'm afraid. It's as simple as that. How do you get them? From us, it's quite simple. We just need a few details from you and we'll arrange for a subscription and a permit. We'll come back to that. And you go to our website, hydro.gov.au. You then go from our homepage to products and services and product downloads. Right, subscriptions and permits, what are they? Subscription is, in rough handfuls, tell us what you want to get and for how long. It's like my favourite, ma my favourite car magazine, I'd like to have my favourite car magazine, my wife would like better homes and gardens and we would like it for all of this year please. That's a subscription. It's a subscription in our context as well. A permit, on the other hand, is, in the magazine analogy, what allows you to open the January edition or the February edition. It doesn't control what you receive. It just controls that you're opening the right version. So if we have updated an existing ENC, no permit required. If you have got a new ENC, a replacement one, or we've completely tossed the old one, replaced it with a new one, you'll need a new permit and we will just send it to you for free. You don't pay for it again. Not like a paper chart where you've got to go and buy a new one. The other one is that a subscription will give you five instances of ENCs. It doesn't give you one. A paper chart, if you buy one, you've got one. ENCs, if you buy one, you've got five. So that means you can have one on a primary system, one on a backup system, one at home, or whatever mix you want to do. But that's what we mean by multiple permits, or multiple subscriptions. The details that we would get would allow us to then uh, give you a base data set. We update the data set every six months, January and, Ju and July. All that is is because the number of updates going onto it gradually accumulates and it just gets bigger and bigger and harder to deal with. Uh, the UK version of this is they release them at all sorts of times. We just settle on six month breaks. You then get an update data set that is built upon the latest base. So if you get an update in August, it will be based upon the July base data set. If you get one in September, still based on the July base data set and so on. In January, you won't get an update data set, you'll just get an entire new one. We've got two ways of downloading these things. You can either do them every fortnight Along, alongside notices to mariners. The easier one is actually to do what we call cumulative. So we just simply put all the updates on there in order, in the correct order. So if you haven't updated your charts in three months, don't go and get every second, for, second week. Just get the latest one and they'll all just zip straight in. Far easier. So if your logic is, I'm just going to update my charts before the sailing season, grab the cumulative one before you start sailing or grab it just before you go on the, whatever the big race is. That sort of mentality. And as, again, if you need permits, we will send them to you. Understanding these things, they are a little different to paper charts. Certainly people's perceptions of them are somewhat different. So there's a few simple guides that are around. Anything that I've said about unofficial charts, and I'm not saying don't use them, I'm saying use them with caution because they don't warrant them for navigation, neither do we. For good reference, that's fine. If you know you're in open water, that's fine. 
make sure you're in open water first. And that's basically what that says. If you need to know how accurate the charts are, there's a handy little guide there that applies probably more to paper charts than it does to ENCs, but the same information is still relevant. And these are just free downloads off our website. And they are in response to years of frequently asked questions on these sorts of subjects. If you want, actually want to know the full answer for ENCs, there's actually another free download. We have a publication that's called, currently called the Seafarers Handbook for Australian Waters. It's full of bureaucratic stuff. It's how to navigate the bureaucracy. You know, how to get clear customs, how to um, know when you are and aren't allowed to um, ditch certain particles in the, in the waste disposal. Uh, how, how and where to arrange for oil and customs and, and pilots and all sorts of things. You're probably not interested. But one chapter is about the accuracy of electronic navigation charts. It's about 18 pages and it's focused solely on that. That chapter is a free download. So if you want to get it, go get it. For those of you that um, really want the abridged version, uh, when uh, Andy Green shows you some of the stuff uh, or some of the different aspects of ENCs, he will show you, amongst other things, something called zones of confidence. Zones of confidence put every piece of information into a category ranging from really, really good to really, really bad. And it ranges from A to D, A1, A2, B, C or D. Uh, the simplest way is to look at the number of stars, and it uses stars on an electronic chart, to depict how good it is. Six stars is really, really good, two stars is bad. Now relate that to hotels. If you want to stay at a six star hotel, brilliant. Five star hotel, great. Four star hotel, yep, pretty good. Three star hotel, you should be getting a bit concerned. Two star hotel, try and avoid it. The stars on the charts work the same way. That is the really simple analogy. Count the number of stars, figure out which one your wife would like to stay at. So some of the things that we've really, that are really shaping our future is that the demand for paper charts has declined to the point where, in a lot of cases, they can't be justified. We have tried for a decade to get more resources. It is not going to happen. We moved out of Navy. We are not part of Navy anymore to try and get more resources. For a while it actually worked. And then they decided they were going to have a space race and they going to have satellite communications and all that sort of thing. And those people are all coming out of the same people budget. So we're losing. The end result is that 80% of the, the updates that we do, and that is most of our business, affect port charts. Big ships can't get into ports with paper charts already. They are already too small a scale for what they need to do because big ships have grown in size. They are bigger. So if they can't use the paper chart, why are we making them? And that is the simple question. We've had a look at which ones we can withdraw without affecting people in a practical sense, and the answer is about 50%. This is just the large scale charts. So Sydney Harbour, for example, goes from four charts, and I'll bet there's probably three that you never use, and we'll just keep the one that covers the entirety of Sydney Harbour. You know, there are three charts of Coburn Sound in WA. Why? Uh, one of them covers the Navy base, and the Navy base has been using electronic charts since 2012. They have never used a paper chart since 2012. Um, so why should it stay? So we're also looking at the coastal charts. They don't affect us quite as much, but you've got to rationalise somewhere. If people want the full de detail of ENCs, they're not constrained by the size of a piece of paper. So we can actually do what people want and not wonder whether it fits under A0 or A1 or whatever. Suddenly, the world is your oyster. We have all sorts of funny shaped electronic navigation charts. The ongoing availability of the remaining charts, whichever ones they are, is actually dependent upon commercial demand. And as that demand declines, the UK in particular will drop them. So it's all very well to say, well, the printing is going to be stopped in the UK, the chart agents will pick it up. 
but they might not be available in the pipeline for them to print if the UK has dropped them. Uh, and we might be in the same position. These are some of the things that we've yet to work out. Uh, some of them might be that we just go to a static chart and we say, here you go, here's a PDF file. Uh, I've got an alternative one that I'll print to in a second as well, though. Uh, we are, I would say, preparing to do direct sales, but I have no desire to do direct sales. So this is just something that we're going to be keeping in our back pocket in case the chart agencies uh, reduced to a point where there aren't enough businesses going around. And I would very much hope that they don't. And I think that most of that's going to have to come from a fundamental reshaping of our pricing models and all that sort of thing. Because it still has to be viable for a chart agency because they are a commercial business. And we do recognise that and we need to make sure that that happens. That's in everybody's interest. <coughs> right, so some of the things that we're talking about the paper chart now says, for more detail, refer to the ENC. Might not affect you, but it does affect big ships. Um, you know, here's the example. That little island off, off Quinana is called Rottnest Island. It's either a navy base or a, a, a national park. There are more Tamars on that thing than you know what to do with because they're so protected. But the big ships that go, you know, come into Coburn Sound and turn west, they're all electronic. The big ships come in to, and go to the east, go to Quinana, they're all in refit. They're all big ships again, so they're all using electronic. Why are we making paper? The answer is, we're not going to. These are the ones that are going in WA. Uh, all the southwest corner, all the 150,000s are going. There's the ones that we envisage going around the rest of Australia in the fairly short term. Uh, Queensland, the Great Barrier Reef, all the larger scale charts will go, apart from sufficient to still get you into a port on one chart rather than three or four. Cairns, for example, has three. Um, Northwest Shelf, we've actually already withdrawn them. The enemy ships operating out of there are over 200,000 tonnes. They really don't use paper charts. Uh, you know, when you sold 18 charts in a year, and I mean 18 in that area, you think, um, Bass Strait, we've got one covering all of Bass Strait, every big ship coming through is using electronic, so let's just leave one that allows the Melbourne to Hobart yacht race to happen, um, or the, the cross-channel ferry, you know, that's his backup, that sort of thing. Sydney Harbour, as I said, four ports down to one. When we looked at all of South East Australia, we can halve the number of paper charts without to anybody's detriment, uh, no detriment to safety, and yet it halves our workload in that, that area. And we can then focus more holistically on everybody's safety. One of the things that we're heading towards is potentially you make your own charts. NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, which is our equivalent in the United States, is already well advanced on developing this. For those of you that know Geospatial Information Systems, this is running on an ESRI platform. You probably might have heard of ESRI, don't know. But they have customised it. Uh, and it is pretty slick. In rough handfuls you say, I want, it, sorry, and it is running on an electronic navigation chart database. So you log into this thing and you say, I'm interested in this bit here, zoom across, zoom in, whatever you want to do. And then you say, right, I want to get from here to here. OK, that's your defined area. You can then say, I want it at a certain scale, and it'll tell you how many pieces of paper you want. And if you say A0, it'll tell you one, and if you say A4, it'll tell you eight. You can then save every one of those, and you make your own chart. They also come as geo-referenced PDFs. So if you put them up in another system, even as a PDF, it'll be in the right place. You can save them as a TIFF, and just print them out like a photo. So that's potentially what's coming. Certainly that is what the US is focusing upon. They are already making electronic navigation charts that have no paper chart equivalent. Uh, and this is where we're probably heading as well. The balance we need to strike is you guys don't have A0 printers at home. They're kind of hard to come by. 
and they cost about $25,000 a pop. So this is where we need to rebalance the pricing model, such as if you want to print an A0 to get into Eden, sorry, uh, sorry, an A4 to get into Eden, that's your get me home in case everything breaks sort of chart, then you probably print it out yourself and put it in a plastic sleeve. If you want the coastal chart, then either if you want to print it out yourself, you're going to have to go to such as boat books and say, dear Wayne, could you please print that for me? And well, this is where we'll have to change the pricing models. I don't know what the answer on that is. Or you go to Wayne and he logs into it and says, what chart would you like? So food for thought. But it does not exclude chart agencies at all. That is not our intention. Our intention is to derive whatever product it is you need from an ENC. If I go back to that original SOLAS definition, it said, or a database suitable for making a, an, a marine chart. Here is something made from that database. It qualifies as a marine chart. Um, it's still a work in progress at this stage. I expect we'll be making it sort of live for demonstrations in about a year's time. Uh, so between now and then, that's where we're going to be starting to work on pricing models and whether it's a licensed or a subscription thing or it's free for all or I really don't know at this stage. At this stage we're just focusing on the technology. But that's the sort of thing that you can derive from it. It looks a little different. The one thing that's missing at the moment is actually the compass rose, uh, if you want one. If you don't want one, you're going to use it on an electronic system, you don't need one. But these are the sorts of things you put in your menu saying, add compass rows. Do you want all the chart notes? Well, on an ENC, they're embedded in it in various places. On a paper chart, they're dotted down you know, the left-hand side or the right-hand side or whatever. But if we're making it from an ENC, this doesn't know where to put them. So they'd probably come out on page two as a little annex. Oh, there you go, a four piece of paper. So just back on the which charts thing, what I wanted to do now was to hand over to Andy Green from 33 South to show, I'm not trying to market a particular system, but he is available, they have a system that works very well, and I know it is in fairly common use. So that is the basis that we have asked 33 South. We're not specifically trying to say one system over another, there are about half a dozen systems that will do this same job, but this one is optimised for sailing, and that's Expedition. Other ones are CIQ, which is quite popular. Uh, it runs on an Apple uh, platform, so if you're interested in iPads, that's the way to go. And there are a few others that I've actually listed in a flyer, which is available at the back of the room if you want to grab it on your way out. So look, I'll just hand over to Andy now. Uh, as I said, Andy works at uh, 33 South Electronics and he's got a degree in naval architecture. That's his background. He's been a navigator for 10 years and a professional navigator for three of those years. Uh, and he sails very, on various on TP-52s both in Australia and around Southeast, Australia, Southeast Asia, seven Sydney to Hobarts. So he's highly qualified to talk about all of this. Uh, at this point, I'll hand over to Andy. Thanks very much. All right, so I'll uh, just demonstrate some of the uh, sort of technical aspects of uh, AUS ENCs within uh, the familiar setting of, of Expedition. Now, Expedition um, added the functionality use AUS ENCs about uh, three years ago, so it's relatively uh, a recent development. Um, so the first aspect that uh, I particularly like about uh, ENCs and Expedition is um, its inclusion of a lot of the noticed mariners. So uh, in the recent Brisbane to uh, Hamilton Island yacht race, um, it's pretty prudent to check all of these notice, uh, notices to mariners. So this particular one was for a, uh, just a wreck um, inside the bunker group. Um, and correspondingly, um, you can see that that wreck has been added into the um, AUS ENCs. So having uh, that extra um, up-to-date uh, level of information is, um, is just great because uh, if the uh, race itself had um, eventuated into this area here, I've been made aware of this particular hazard in here and I can um, navigate around that with the appropriate level of, uh, of caution. 
Um, the other nice thing about these um, isolated uh, dangers, which are shown as this um, uh, magenta cross, is they uh, operate independently of the, um, of the chart scale. So as you can see here, this is the active, active chart that I have open. And regardless of what scale um, I'm zoomed in on within Expedition, it's always there. So um, there's just no ambiguity of, um, there's no surprises uh, basically with these, these um, potential hazards. So if I zoom all the way in, um, you can still see that that, uh, that cross persists throughout um, all those scales. Um, another particular great aspect of AUS ENCs, if I uh, pan down to Newcastle, since that's a good example. Let's try it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just uh, find my way. Um, so the other uh, aspect of AUSC and C's I particularly like is the uh, fact that it's got all the uh, uh, category zone of confidence, uh, which is a measure of the uh, survey detail. So the way you access that is um, just through right-click functionality within Expedition. And if you scroll down to um, query chart objects, it will come up with a, uh, a dialog box, which will um, have uh, towards the bottom this uh, quality of data uh, metric within here. So as you can see for this particular area, just on the approaches to Newcastle outside the main channel, we can see that the zone of confidence for, for this particular area of the chart is confidence B, which is about uh, plus or minus one metre, I believe, and 50 metres of horizontal error. Um, but if I uh, take another query chart object within the channel itself, um, you can see here that there's a much higher quality of data uh, zone of confidence um, A1. So um, I find that to be quite a useful feature uh, when navigating um, to get a gauge of, of you know, how much risk the skipper and the navigator want to put into trying to push, push into a coastline. So having that, that layer of information there is, is certainly useful um, <coughs> to have. Another aspect of uh, ENCs that's uh, of huge benefit is the, um, the auto chart uh, function. So if I pan across to a uh, lower resolution chart off Newcastle, and I'm panning around just trying to get the lay of the land, and I move in towards uh, Newcastle, it'll automatically, uh, it'll automatically zoom into the highest available um, resolution chart. So there's just no, you're always, seeing the highest level of, of detail um, as you're sailing along. And within Expedition, if you've got follow boat enabled, it will, it will, still, it will still do that, um, so long as you've got um, auto chart enabled uh, within this ribbon here. So um, as you're sailing along, it's always going to automatically open the best chart available. And uh, when in doubt, um, if you're panning around, there's also this uh, option here, if I'm really zoomed out, and I want to see uh, the highest resolution chart for this particular area, I can go right click and uh, open best chart and Expedition will automatically um, snap to the best chart available uh, at the highest resolution uh, within that's available. Um, you, you get a lot of the uh, functionality with other charts as well. So if uh, tool tips is a particularly useful one, so I've got this uh, enabled in the top left corner within Expedition. I can uh, mouse over any of these um, uh, features within the chart, such as uh, channel markers, uh, reefs, rocks. Um, it's very useful to pull up uh, light sectors as well. So um, all that information is, is readily available within the chart itself. <coughs> um, the other little, little uh, useful detail that uh, we have within ENCs is uh, particularly of use to uh, formulating strategy for, for racing. If I go back up to the Wit Sundays, this shows it a bit better. Whoop. <coughs> um, this coastline will do. Um, it also contains all uh, these uh, points of land elevation, so I find that to be quite useful as well. Uh, just for gauging, you know, how much, uh, how large a wind shadow is if we're, uh, you know, 
on our way north to, to the Gold Coast. There's some pr- pretty big uh, changes in land elevation, so I find that to be quite a li- little useful tactical uh, piece of information that's um, available within the charts. So you can see here, 169 metre hill, 263 metre high hill, so I find that to be uh, a pretty nice uh, level of detail uh, within the charts. Um, so yeah, that's just some of the some of the key uh, features that I've um, I've been using within the AUS ENCs uh, over other charts. So um, I'll just hand over back to Mike and uh, to take any questions. Thank you. Question. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so that's just that's just a base um, level chart that um, that expedition has. It's it's just uh, a worldwide, very basic sea map uh, chart. Um, all these um, cells that you can see in here are the pre- are the are the loaded AUS ENC. So um, when you load them in and you make sure that you've um, got the ENC is enabled, it'll always stick to the AUS ENC chart. So the C map is just a base level layer um, behind Expedition, if that makes sense. Right. It's effectively the framework that you're just hanging everything else off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right, over to you, Mike. Okay, right. Um, yeah, look, so what I wanted to, to cover was there's an opportunity for the yachting community to potentially change the way that they think about electronic navigation charts rather than them being these unofficial things that should not be relied upon faithfully but could be used for convenience to them being potentially your official carriage requirement to meet a race requirement that's something that's, that's, starting, that's worth starting to think about you would still potentially need some sort of a backup but it might be a second copy. As I said, there's multiple subscriptions available. Um, so there's, there's more ways to skin the cat than, than the current one, particularly because the current one, people are tending to put away the paper charts and use these other ones more so than they potentially should be. Well, if you want that functionality, it does exist in other systems using official charts. And at the moment, they're called ENCs. And I also, as I said, I wanted to highlight that as far as paper charts are concerned, the world is changing. Uh, somebody asked me, it seems a bit counterintuitive to withdraw paper charts to, to improve safety. But I have to think at everybody's safety, not just the paper chart user. And they are very, very much in the minority these days. So that's where we're coming from. <coughs> so look, at this stage, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take a few, or Andy's perhaps happy to take a few. So right at the front, yeah? Uh, thank you. Your early introduction, you talked about a new standard that was going to arise in a couple of years' time. Yep. I don't know if you covered that or not, but all of a sudden you mentioned that a massive increase in the number of charts was going to come about with that new standard. Yes, there is another standard coming. Uh, that it's driven, for the most part, by big ships. The S57 standard has been largely frozen since inception by the International Maritime Organisation. We got it up to version 3, and then we had tiny little increments after that. The International Hydrographic Organisation, so this is the people that, that drive making the charts, not governing safety ultimately, said, sod this, we can make better ones, and proposed it to the IMO, and it became something called S100. It makes things far more plug and play than they are at the moment. In that range will be both ENCs, which will be called S101 ENCs, not S57, but they'll largely be the same. But a whole bunch of other things that provide much better functionality, uh, such as 3D contours, uh, live tidal uh, feeds into systems, uh, live ice warnings, uh, medical aid, books that are online. It, It covers every spectrum of international maritime organisation services. Everything to, to medical advice will also fall into this category. Um, and it specifies all sorts of things from sort of, these are the radio frequencies, these are the, the binary signals that go through AIS, this is the format for a picture. Uh, but all of these things are laid down. So we have to abide by that. Hmm. Sorry, yep. Uh, look, I probably speak for every race we have got in the room uh, when I say that I'd be very happy to get rid of the 
<laughs> right. Every race, come out, get packaged, get zipped up, get thrown in the dirt, get thrown in the dry spot, yep. and get taken up and repacked yep. at the end of the race. Yep. I don't use them. I don't know of any racing yachtsman who does. Right. If our electronics all go out, I have two alternatives. I have a mobile and, phone. And that's good, actually. Yep. And that's. When I'm further offshore, I have a handheld GPS. And that's genuinely. That's, all I need. that's genuinely what we think. Um, look, one thing I would say though is. If there are people that are particularly wedded to some chart, well, you know, we're, we're listening. Well, I won't say we'll agree, but we will we'll listen. Uh, and certainly some ports are certainly active on that front, till you find out they're using to rest their coffee cups on in their tea room. But never mind. Sorry, yeah? Uh, I've got a lot of uh, stuff printed in office works. Yeah. Large scale, but facilities available all over Australia now. Well, that's quite possible. You know, other ones that, that yeah, yeah. Look for, for other things. I've taken things on a memory stick to quick copy and had them printed out. Uh, so there are all sorts of ways of potentially doing it. Uh, but honestly, we haven't really worked out the full details yet. At the moment, we're just working on the technology of let's generate a chart from an ENC. Yeah. Now, I mean, we we do this in house already. We've been doing this in-house since, what, 2012-ish? But at the moment, there's still a lot of cartographic intervention to make that electronic thing look like that paper thing, the one you're used to. We're trying to get rid of that effort because that effort takes more than it deserves. It takes longer to do that than it does to make the E and C itself. Sorry, yeah. A question for Andy. Does uh, do, do the E and C charts give you the option Yeah, they do. Um, I can quickly show you that setting uh, in here. So yeah, we, it's all there uh, within shed, uh, settings, uh, charts, and um, here's your, all your um, uh, parameters for setting uh, uh, shallow depth, uh, deep depth, which is the green shading you can see through here, uh, and the safety depth is um, what I showed you before, those magenta crosses, those isolated dangers that uh, t specifies at what uh, what level you should see those. So if you only draw three metres, you don't have to see uh, isolated dangers six metres below the water. So it declutters the chart, essentially. So when, when you're doing that, the darkest blue shade is also driven by that safety depth that you have put in. What it does do, though, is say you put in one that says three metres, because that's your keel draft. If there is no three metre contour, and there won't be, it will snap to the next deeper one. So you'll end up with one that says five metres. And if we've only got a 10 metre, you know, it goes zero to 10, you'll end up with 10 metres, unfortunately. That's where a lot of our work is focused on for big ships, is to put in one metre contours, because that affects their loading to a massive degree. Sorry, there's another question. Gerard, yep. Uh, look, there are, a, I think there's well over a hundred systems that use ENCs or thereabouts. I, I couldn't name them all to save my life. What we do know is the ones that we regularly uh, put subscriptions to uh, and, and th the best place to look is on the flyer that's at the back of the room where I've listed the most common half dozen that are used in Australia. You know, some of them work on, on iPads, some of them work on Mac. Some of them work on DOS-based systems, so there is a variety there. Uh, so if, you know, if you, if you want to run around and you know, nip, nick the, lap, the you know the iPad from home and use that, you can. Um, how so, accurate are, are, are these maps in areas like Fiji, where I was recently shown something called Ovitel map, <coughs> which is a hybrid, um, basically look. Uh, from from at, at, at the actual reef and bodies yep. and, and all sorts of things that you can't see on normal charts. So what do you what do you mean by hybrid? What's it bringing in? It's printing a chart as well as as um, 
as a look um, as a uh, Google. Map. Oh, Im so imagery. Correct. Right. Okay. From basically a, a, a sharp image where you can actually see the reef that doesn't appear on on those charts. Okay. Um, That's Chinese, look, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look. I imagery, generally speaking, is actually fairly well positioned. Uh, how, however, the, you get in a bit of a sort of a circular argument that sometimes the imagery has been positioned off the charts and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, you know, the, the, the mapping mechanism for Google Earth actually works on hexagons. You know, how do you relate that to squares? Uh, it's actually very difficult. So you do get some distortions. Having said that, in remote areas, the paper chart or the ENC will have probably come from a very old survey. It doesn't matter what format you're looking at, it's about the data, you know, the information on it. Yeah. And if it's come from pre-Captain Cook, it's as good as Captain Cook and no better. Yeah. doesn't matter how glossy the picture is. So that imagery in that regard will probably be better. It certainly was. Uh, I mean, Navionics, for instance, would take you straight onto the reef. Yep. Um, whereas, um, with overtel, with the overlay, you could see you were going yep. onto the reef, so obviously... Yep. Yeah. You know, the official line that we take in our office is we don't use Google Earth. However, as a reference, it's actually pretty useful. You know, we might not be able to position something exactly, but we can certainly see that it's there. Uh, and that would be the line that we take. Uh, we've had, we have had the opposite occasionally. Uh, there was one uh, that was called Sandy Islet. There was a great hoo-ha in the newspaper a few years ago now because these scientists from Sydney Uni had discovered it wasn't there. And this was a major discovery. It was picked up in the newspaper. In each fact, it hasn't been there ever, which is a minor detail. But the US, in their grab for geospatial information for their Navy, which they subsequently released to the world, left a hole for something that was reported, I have to say, over a drunken lunch in 1874 on a British ship. And that really is the origin of it. Um, and they left a hole in it. And Google Earth left a hole in it to fit the island in. And it just became a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's actually been disproved about four times since 1979 by both the Australians and the French. But it makes sense to incorporate Google Earth to have a, to have a satellite imagery of where you're going so you can actually see what's going, what's going on. If, if you've got access to it, it won't do you any harm. I wouldn't necessarily rely on it to the, the umpteenth metre, but as a general indication and a few boat lengths type of distance, uh, and stay out of the surf zone obviously, uh, it's, it's better to have more information than less. Yeah. Hang on, sorry. My yacht has an exit. Somebody dies. Right. Just the coroner. Yep. Where am I sitting in terms of top quality? If you, no, pa paper doesn't come into this. Official versus unofficial comes into this. So if you were using an official ENC or an, or an official paper nautical chart, then the Commonwealth is effectively liable. Uh, if you are using an unofficial chart in any format, then you, you're wearing it yourself and you cross your fingers that your insurance company will pay out apart from anything else. Uh, so that's the position. It's not about paper versus electronic. It's about official versus unofficial. Sorry, yeah? Mike, I heard, I heard what I thought was an extraordinarily generous offer, so I'm just trying to understand if it's true. I heard that for a single subscription, one could, one could install that base on five different devices. I think that's what I heard. Yes, that's right. Yes. Five different devices. Yes. That's extraordinarily generous. Right. Yeah, well, it, it, it is... Price. <laughs> well, you know, it's either that or five. Okay, look, I'll, I'll, I honestly don't know exactly what the prices are, frankly. That's a bit, it's a bit of a shame. Um, we normally deal in what we call coastal packs, uh, which are a slightly smaller chunk of the ocean. Uh, the Voyager ones tend to be favoured by the, the yachts people, or cruising people mainly, actually. Uh, sorry? Right. Okay. Right, but in rough handfuls, it works out to less than a dollar per ENC. So, paper chart, $35 each versus $1 each, I think you get a pretty good deal. You know, for a, for a coastal pack, 
I've got shackles at home and, and, and main sheet blocks that cost more than a year's worth of, of electronic charts, to put it in, in a context. Right, okay. I should know. Uh, is there any more right. questions at all? Um, well, I think that was a very enlightening evening and I'd like okay. to thank both our presenters uh, with a, a hand. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, as you know, we have our second uh, first Tuesday, uh, we're always putting something on for you of interest to you. Our next Tuesday night will be on medical emergencies at sea, um, whereby if you break a leg or something like that, um, most people only use senior first aid or apply first aid for all what you wish. But um, so we're getting some doctors down here who specialise in this type of inju injury and also um, going to concentrate on injections. Um, we have had uh, a few problems with people not being able to give injections and tell you how about how you should handle yourself if you have such an emergency. Uh, we, after that one, our next educational will possibly be in a day. We're working for it today and we'll be getting AMSA, uh, Cordia, um, Water Police and Helicopter Rescue to tell you what to do if you put out a May Day. And uh, so that's about the size of the evening. So thank you very much for attending. <laughs>